the year 2000 witnessed a significant event in the history of biker clubs in Ontario, Canada. In an unprecedented move, the national president of the Canadian Hells Angels made an offer to several Ontario biker clubs to join the Hells Angels, patch for patch, whereby they could enter the club with patches equivalent to what they had now. This offer was accepted by a majority of the Paradise Riders, as recalled by David Atwell, a former member of the club. His decision to join the Hells Angels led him to be disillusioned with his former comrades and ultimately turn on them, becoming a government informant. The ceremony held on December 29th, 2000 at the Hells Angels Clubhouse in Montreal marked the inclusion of 168 bikers from various Ontario biker clubs, such as Satan's Choice, the Vagabonds, the Lobos, the Last Chance, the Paradise Riders, and some of the Lunars, making the Hells Angels the biggest and most dominant one-percenter club in Ontario overnight. This presentation explores the events leading to the Hells Angels' dominant position in Ontario, the impact of the patch-for-patch -patch offer, and the reasons for David Atwell's betrayal of his former brothers. This is the story of the highest-ranking Hells Angel to ever flip on the club and becoming a government informant. This is Biker History with Magnus. But before we begin, please like and subscribe. It really helps out the channel a lot with the algorithms and blah, blah, blah. Let's get to it. David Atwell was born in Scarborough, Ontario, and started to work as a bouncer in Toronto as a teenager. In 1983, Atwell started working as a security guard, and his mentor was a British immigrant and a former Royal Marine. He described his mentor, Jim, as a tough veteran of the Falklands War who taught him how to serve as a bodyguard. After becoming a Hells Angel, he described his role at the new club as cleaning tables, getting drinks and food for the full patches, and described the new Ontario Hells Angels as secondary to the long-standing Quebec chapter, with some even getting a French accent in an attempt to sound like the Quebec Angels. He had his apprehensions, but was told that nothing would change except the patches they wore on their backs, something he would later regret saying in his book, I don't have what it takes to become a full-patched member of an established chapter of Hell's Angels, which is a weird thing coming from a member that later became the sergeant-at-arms of his chapter, the highest position in a one-percenter club. He claims that he lacked the predator instinct and natural criminality, people who can take advantage of things like the fentanyl epidemic in Canada, saying they're feeding it. As a result of the mass patchover, Ontario went from having no Hells Angels chapters to having 14. The two Paradise Rider chapters in Toronto both became Hells Angels, giving Toronto a total of six Hells Angels chapters. The new chapter in Niagara was led by Gerald Skinny Ward, a man who, according to Atwell, didn't even know how to ride a motorbike at all. However, the Niagara chapter had an almost monopoly on drug dealings in the Niagara Peninsula. This made them very attractive to the Hells Angels, and Walter Statnick decided to allow them to join the Angels. This decision caused tension, requiring Walter Statnick to visit Toronto to resolve the dispute. Atwell described Statnick as cordial but very cagey and careful about what he said. Life in Hell's Angels was a privileged lifestyle. David says he was treated differently by everyone, and he quickly got used to it. Going to any bar in Scarborough, there was never any doubt that he would be treated with special attention. He would never have to wait in line, and a great seat and a cold beer would be waiting for him before he even sat down. He never had to pay for anything. His patch was like a credit card that he never had to pay off. That's how people treated me, and it was easy to get used to. Being a Hell's Angel was not like any other career, he says, because there was no off switch. The club was his life, and he was a Hell's Angel 24-7. Even when he wasn't with the club, he was doing something related to the club. It was a way of life that those close to him just had to put up with. It wasn't a job. It was a commitment. The club doesn't just take over your life. It becomes your life. He rose up the ranks of the Hell's Angels to become the sergeant-at-arms, the highest level in a one-percenter chapter. However, 
He was arrested shortly after that, after selling drugs to a woman who turned out to be a police informer. It was during this time that Atwell says he became disenchanted with the general immorality and selfishness within the Hells Angels, saying, After the arrest, I began to see the club in an entirely different perspective. The guys weren't Hells Angels because they wanted to ride bikes and have a good time together. They were all in it for themselves. The arrest forced him to live on bail for the next 20 months, during which he incurred large legal debts and had to live with his father to save money. The charges were later dropped when a judge ruled that the police had not obtained a proper warrant for the bug that recorded him selling the drugs, but he had got a lot of debt, and he also lost his job as a security guard when they found out he was a member of Hell's Angels. When the charges against him were stayed, which means the charges against him resulted only in a stay of proceedings, not an acquittal, which meant that there was a possibility that the charges could be brought back again. The others in the club expected him to go back to work for them, even though this had ruined his ability to work for anyone else, saying he felt trapped by the limitations the club had put on his life. He wanted out, but knew it wouldn't be easy. He couldn't just quit and be an ex-Hell's Angel whose name had been in every newspaper. Looking for a job would be tough because nobody would hire him for that because of his affiliation with the club. He says he was at a crossroads and had to make a decision that would change his life forever. David was approached by two officers from the Ops Anti-Biker Enforcement Unit and now started working as an informant in what was code-named Project Develop. He provided information to the police from 2005 and was paid $1,850 a week by the authorities, a total of $450,000. David Atwell claims he became an informer for moral reasons, not financial, and that he only agreed to accept the money following advice from Jim, his Royal Marine mentor, because he would need the extra money while living in witness protection. Early in 2006, Atwell recorded an Iranian immigrant who had fought in the Iran-Iraq war, met her dad Juicy Bauman. Bauman was talking to him about his collection of submachine guns. His experience with guns was useful for the Angels to such an extent that they waived their usual whites only policy to allow him to join. Nevertheless, Tensions were high among the Angels, as rumors circulated about an informant in their ranks, and the member Donnie Peterson was on the hunt for the rat, making David Atwell's life even more stressful. What made it worse was that Peterson and Douglas Miles, the vice president of the downtown Toronto chapter, were two of Atwell's closest friends. It was an awkward and uncomfortable situation, since Atwell was secretly recording their conversations for the police. Peterson had even been the best man at Atwell's wedding, while Atwell had served as the master of ceremonies at Miles's wedding. He couldn't believe he had to betray his closest friends, but he was committed to his work as an informant. Making Atwell's work even more difficult were the Project Tandem raids in September 2006. A number of Hell's Angels were arrested due to information provided by Stephen Galt, the treasurer of the Oshawa chapter, who had become an informant. This led to an intense atmosphere of paranoia within the club, and Atwell's paranoia was escalating. He claims he never had much respect for Galt, a man whom he greatly disliked, and claiming that there was a difference between him and Galt, whom he accused of becoming an informer. To save his own skin, and he was a real hardcore criminal, he had even bragged about killing people. I, on the other hand, was just trying to get out of a life that had spun out of control. The stress was taking its toll on Atwell, and he started to abuse cocaine, something he was often scolded for by both his fellow angels and his police handlers. I was feeling very alone as an agent. I felt I had no friends. I let my guard down. It was torture. I lied from the moment I woke up to the moment I went to bed. My dad and my girlfriend at the time couldn't know. It tore me apart. He recorded all his meetings and discussions with Campbell on drug dealings. As a result of information provided by Atwell, the police intercepted several shipments of GMB, the date-rape drug, placing Bauman into debt worth about $100,000, 
forcing several other members of the Angels to step in to bail out Bauman. It was in February 2007 that his brothers started to suspect that he was an informer. During a meeting in Atwell's garage, Miles accused him of being an informer, pointing out that you are buying far too many drugs from too many people than necessary. It's the classic behavior of a police informer trying to incriminate his accomplices. Atwell's worst fears were realized when he asked why he had not been killed if he was a suspected informer, and Miles replied, That's why we're here right now. He was terrified, knowing that his fellow angels were planning to kill him. He couldn't understand why Miles had spared him, but he noticed coldness in his fellow angels, despite their superficial attempts to be friendly. Their smiles and jokes seemed forced. Atwell's handlers recognized the danger and ordered him into witness protection, believing that he would be murdered soon. The information Atwell gathered, along with a series of police raids on Hell's Angels clubhouses across Ontario, gave the police a great propaganda victory. However, one biker expert, Yves Levine, was not impressed with the Project Develop raids, saying, Biker clubhouses have been raided for decades. They know not to keep guns, drugs, or incriminating evidence there, and none has ever been found in a clubhouse in this province. But it's good for the media. It's good for the cameras. In April 2007, the police charged 31 Hells Angels with 169 criminal charges, plus seized drugs worth $3 million, and property worth a half million dollars. At the trials in 2010 and 2011, Atwell was the star witness Five Hell's Angels members, including John Winner Neal, the president of the downtown Toronto chapter, were convicted on charges relating to dealing in GHB and cocaine, plus possession of illegal weapons, but all were acquitted on charges of belonging to a criminal organization. The trials were to be some of the longest trials in Canadian history. When taking the stand, Atwell said, I'm a rat. I've got to be hiding for the rest of my life. One of the accused angels, Larry Pooler, whom acted as his own lawyer, noted that Atwell, while working as an informer, had smashed up an automobile with a baseball bat to resolve a business dispute. This undermined Atwell's credibility and made it look like he was a violent man who had only turned informer to protect himself. The trial ended with Neil, Bauman, and Miles being convicted of trafficking in GMB, Campbell convicted of trafficking in cocaine, and Pooler convicted of the possession of an illegal weapon. Living in witness protection was psychologically very difficult, with Atwell saying, It's a lonely life about moving around and not having any stability. What can I do? I can only imagine getting close to someone. If someone cares about someone, whether it's a friend, a platonic relationship, or an intimate one with the opposite sex, you can only go so far before that person who cares for you ask, Well, what happened before that? Where did you come from? I can't share any of that with anyone. His life became a life of endless paranoia, scared of being recognized, stating that he has no control over his life, as his police handlers decided where he would live, where he would work, without him being able to influence this in any way. He later wrote a book, The Hard Way Out, My Life with the Hells Angels and Why I Turned Against Them, about his time in the Hells Angels and how it is for him to live in witness protection. The book is one of the sources for this video. But what do you guys think? Please leave a comment below on your thoughts about David Atwell and what he did. And please give this video a thumbs up and subscribe. You can also check out my other videos here on this channel to see if there are others you would find interesting. And I hope to see you in the next one.